Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people. Explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity. I've been taking a Skillshare class called Productivity Masterclass, Principles and Tools to Boost Your Productivity, taught by Ali Abdal. This is really good for me because I love to procrastinate and I can't right now. I have so much going on and this class is helping me be far more efficient. Skillshare offers membership with meaning, with so much to explore, real projects to create, and the support of fellow creatives. Skillshare is also incredibly affordable. An annual subscription is less than $10 a month. Explore your creativity at Skillshare.com slash respect. And the first 1,000 people to use our link will get a free trial of Skillshare premium membership. Receive free access to thousands of classes for a limited time. Be one of the first 1,000 to sign up at Skillshare.com slash respect. Is there something interfering with your happiness or maybe something preventing you from achieving your goals? If you feel this way, it's totally normal. And BetterHelp is here to help. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You'll connect in a safe and private online environment and anything you say is confidential. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. If you are in need of a little help, even if it's just a check-in, BetterHelp is a wonderful option. I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting BetterHelp.com slash Ratchet. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Ratchet. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the fuck is going on I I don't know where to begin like the last week feels like a year last week the podcast went up late I was having some tech difficulties it didn't go up until like 6 p.m it was relevant people were listening and then Friday at 1 a.m the occupant announces that he has COVID he and his wife and ever since then we've been on like a rough ride through a shit storm Rarely am I at a loss for words. I don't know what to say and I don't know where to start. As I'm taping, the leading news story right now is a plot to kidnap the governor of Michigan, Big Gretch. That's what they've affectionately been calling her in in Detroit, Gretchen Whitmer. She was also up for consideration for VP at one point. Apparently, the black folks in Detroit like her, hence the nickname Big Gretch. There was a story about how they raised money or something like $3,000 to buy her a pair of buffs, which I had to go look up what buffs were. Like I got family in Detroit, but I haven't hung out there in a really long time. It's these Cartier Buffalo horn sunglasses that retail for $29.50. I don't like nobody enough to raise money for $3,000 glasses. I can think of a lot more better ways to spend three G's. I'm just saying. I need to go see these glasses for three G's. They got diamonds in these glasses. That's a lot of money for a pair of goddamn glasses. Anyway, the details of this kidnapping plot, and this is according to the Washington Post, the FBI revealed on Thursday it thwarted a plot to kidnap the Michigan governor. They said six people had contemplated a violent overthrow of the government. And then state authorities, I'm going to assume this is Michigan State, charged seven more people who said they wanted to attack police and ignite a civil war. According to an FBI affidavit, the plotters seemed to be motivated by their belief that state governments, including Michigan's, were violating the Constitution. One of those involved complained in June that Whitmer was controlling the opening of gyms. 
I just want to be clear. The complaint here was not that I've been forced into unemployment or I've lost my job. I'm unable to feed my family. This person that they're citing was upset about not being able to work out at the gym. You can't make this shit up. Still from the Washington Post. According to federal and state officials, the plotters were extremists who were linked to a militia group called the Wolverine Watchmen. The group tried to evade detection at one point meeting in the basement of a shop that was accessible through a trap door hidden under a rug. Several members of the group participated in firearms training. They also attempted to make and test improvised explosive devices. Those devices ultimately did not detonate as planned. In addition to the plot of storming the state capitol, the group also discussed shooting up Whitmer's vacation home or trying to abduct her as she left the state capitol or from her official summer residence. This is fucking nuts. In September, according to again the affidavit, some of the men drove to the area surrounding Whitmer's residence and discuss detonating explosives to divert police, even checking the underside of a bridge for spots to place a bomb. What am I reading? Also, I think it's worth noting here that this this type of shit is directly traced back to Trump. He's been very, very critical of Whitmer. Back in April, when these militia groups were storming the state capitol with guns, he was tweeting shit like, quote, liberate Michigan. You gave people the go-ahead to go do crazy shit like this, sir, Mr. President. I just, this is the lead news story. This country is in fucking chaos. Absolute fucking chaos. You know, like on CNN or even like PBS, they'll do those like, oh, decade in review. Like these are the 60s. These are the 70s. I feel like when they get to 2020, they're going to be like, all right, we're just going to do a 10-part docuseries on just this year. I, I, I can't believe this is life. I really can't. Just, we are sliding downhill in shit. I, the other big news story this morning is Trump has pulled out of the second POTUS debate. The Commission on POTUS Debates, it has a formal name, but that's what we're going with right now because that's what's in my notes. They want to do a virtual debate largely because Trump is currently and actively infected with COVID-19. And he won't give a clear timeline on his diagnosis. The press has asked his doctors, the White House, anyone they can get access to, hey, when was Trump's last negative COVID test? And when was his first positive COVID test? And we can't get a clear answer. Trump, who has bragged for months that he gets tested for COVID every day, it turns out that he does not get tested for COVID every day. This, despite walking around the White House and everywhere else with no damn mask on. So because of all this crazy ass behavior and the inability to figure out when this man actually got COVID and when he will not be contagious because we can't get a clear timeline, the commission on debates was like, no, we're not doing in person. We're going to do virtual debates because you, sir, are a goddamn health risk. The last presidential debate, with Trump and Biden out in Ohio, 11 staffers in Ohio got COVID. You can't be out here playing these kind of games with people's lives. It's the smart decision to make the debate virtual. The occupant went off. He called up Fox and was like, it's pointless to have virtual debates. They're just going to mute my mic whenever I say something they don't like. They're siding with Joe Biden. I'm not doing that shit. His campaign manager, who also has COVID, he said in an actual statement, quote, for the swamp creatures at the President Debate Commission to now rush to Joe Biden's defense by unilaterally canceling an in-person debate is pathetic. Mind you, they did not cancel the debate. They changed the format of the debate because one of the members debating has an active COVID infection. The fuck? When I got to the part about swamp creatures, I was like, did I, did I click on the wrong site? I searched for, for Trump's response, and I thought I clicked on a legitimate news site. I scrolled down to what I thought was NPR. Maybe I clicked on satire. I'm not sure, because I was like, is an official representative of Trump's campaign referring to people as swamp creatures? I just, I just, I just, 
This is what politics is right now. This shit show. I, and it gets nuttier. We're not done. Trump was like, you know what? Instead of doing a debate, I'm going to hold a rally. What? Sir, you are actively, currently, positively infected with COVID-19. How the fuck are you talking about going around people, doing a rally? You want to kill the few people left who will actually vote for your ass? What are you doing? Isolate yourself. Sit the fuck down. I just... Your president ain't done. Your president ain't done. President Trump claimed on Wednesday... I can't even believe what I'm reading. I believe this is also NPR. I just like to cite my sources. That catching the coronavirus was, quote, a blessing from God. He says the drugs that he received... Notably, an unproven therapeutic that this drug was a miracle cure. He got on Fox saying that he's no longer contagious, which has any doctor confirmed this? He's running around telling people, I feel better than I did 20 years ago. Sir, I believe that's the steroids you're taking. He's pumped up on a million fucking drugs. And at this point, I would like folks to remember Herman Cain who seemingly was infected with COVID-19 while attending a Trump rally. Herman Cain got that shit, got sick, got to the hospital, and then was talking about, oh, I feel great. I feel amazing. Three days later, his ass was dead. I'd also like to point out that the two news stories that I have just recapped for you are coming the morning after the vice presidential debates. I'm recording this on Friday afternoon in LA. I'm watching CNN Literally no one is talking about the vice presidential debate. I, and I'm going to talk about it later because it's, it's a whole segment within itself. But literally no one is talking about the vice presidential debate because of all the shit that's happened in like, I don't know, in the 16 hours since they ended. Jesus, help. If you are a non-American and you are listening to this podcast, help. We need help over here. We are not okay. Help. Send help. I'm not joking. We need help. Like, this is crazy. We are living in crazy town. I'm not a historian, but I took a lot of history classes. And and I watch a lot of documentaries. And I watch the History Channel. And I watch the news. And I read a lot. I can't give you all the dates and details of things. But, like, the United States is on the brink of fucking collapse. Help. This feels like what Germany looked like in the documentaries about the 30s and 40s. This feels like what Egypt looked like in 2013. Which, actually, that's not really a bad thing because Egypt overthrew a dictator. Egypt, if you're listening, send help in the form of directions. We need help. Help us. Help us get this mofo out of office. Help. Oh, I'm going to recap With commentary, more highlights of Trump and this virus. And I'm going to do it on the back end of our chat today. Because I could really just do this whole episode on Trump. And I really don't want to. Because I feel like I'm going fucking nuts. I think you can hear it in my voice. I want to talk about some of the pop culture and entertainment stuff that has happened this week. Because some of it's really notable. And I don't want to, to overlook it. And I'm trying not to drive myself crazy. So. Shout out to Michaela Angela Davis. She was a guest on the show a couple weeks ago talking about black hair. She's the author of Mariah Carey's new book, and it hit number one on the New York Times bestsellers list. Michaela is a wonderful journalist. She's also a mentor of mine, has been for many, many years, almost two decades, actually, at this point. But congratulations to her. That is a major accomplishment. I have not read the book. I ordered a bunch of books from Amazon right before I got on the plane last night. I didn't want to order them in D.C. and then either have to carry them back or ship them back. So I have a bunch of books coming. The Meaning of Mariah is Michaela's book. So I can't wait to read. I've been reading and watching interviews. Mariah did an interview with Oprah where she talked about like some crazy shit that happened in her marriage. I was like, girl, what? You couldn't leave your own goddamn house? She was also on the cover of New York Magazine. I bought the issue in Maryland and I brought it back with me, but I haven't had a chance to read it yet. It's a lot going on. So I will get to that at some point. Hmm. Meg Thee Stallion was on Saturday Night Live. I tuned in late. I only saw the second performance of Savage. 
I saw some folks mention that she was lip syncing or the lip syncing was a little off. And in fairness, she didn't always put the mic up to her face when her voice was coming over the speakers. Like she's not the greatest lip syncer. But I kind of thought that like complaining about some of that was it was very petty in comparison to the message of her performance. I will say that before she got to the good part, I did think that she looked a little stiff when she was dancing. But I didn't think like, oh, she's stiff and doesn't know how to perform. I thought she looks like she might still be in pain. I mean, the woman was recently shot in the foot or the feet. Baby girl like took two bullets and and kept going. Even if you're over, which she doesn't seem to be the physical part of it. I mean, I think there's some mental hurdles you got to go through that, yo, someone I knew shot me. Like I got shot. Like that's, that's a lot. That's a lot to deal with mentally. But I think that because you know that she is a victim survivor, however you want to frame it, of domestic violence, interpartner violence, I I guess that's the the politically correct term now. I thought that that made her message on Saturday Night Live, which was protect black women, even more powerful. When she was performing Savage, she did it in front of this like black and white screen and it had the message protect black women. And then later the sound of shots went off and then the screen had bullet holes all over it. And she played audio clips from from Malcolm X's very famous speech, who taught you to hate yourself? Maybe it's me. When they played that clip, it didn't sound like Malcolm X's voice to me. It sounded like someone else reading Malcolm X's voice. This could all be in my head. It just didn't sound like Malcolm X to me. But here's the part that she quoted. The most disrespected, unprotected, neglected person in America is the black woman. And there was also this quote, who taught you to hate the texture of your hair, the color of your skin, the shape of your nose? Who taught you to hate yourself from the top of your head to the soles of your feet? That was from Malcolm X's speech. And that was in 1962. But it's just as relevant 60 years later as it was when he spoke it then. She also had a quote from from activist Tamika Mallory, one of my personal heroes. The woman's been arrested like 50 million times. Know that she literally puts her her body and her life on the line trying to get black people the rights and justice that they deserve. But she played the clip from Tamika Mallory. She gave a speech in Louisville after the grand jury had no charges for the three officers involved in Breonna Taylor's death. The quote that Meg played was, Daniel Cameron is no different than the sellout Negroes that sold our people into slavery. After every quote, Meg and her backup dancers, notably in leotards, who just got finished twerking, put their hands up in the air, the black fist of solidarity, yelled savage. If that ain't ratchet and respectable, I loved it. I loved it. Daniel Cameron did not love it. He did not love it, not a little bit. He went on Fox and Friends on Tuesday to respond to Meg's performance. He said that the disparaging remarks she made about him are things that he's heard since college and are common to hear as a black Republican. He said, quote, let me just say that I agree that we need to love and protect our black women. There's no question about that. But the fact that someone would get on national television and make disparaging comments about me because I'm simply trying to do my job is disgusting. Sir, are are you trying to do your job? Because a black woman was killed in your state. A black woman was killed in Louisville while she was sleeping. I ask again, are you doing your job, Daniel Cameron? Are you really? Because I think your job would be finding justice for this dead black woman. You have not done that. You are not doing your job. He insists that as it pertains to Breonna Taylor's case, that he will not cave to the public narrative. He also said that Meg's remarks don't hurt him and they only expose the intolerance that the quote and unquote tolerant left claim to embrace. Cameron did not explain how his failure to demand justice or get justice for Breonna Taylor's death was quote and unquote intolerant. Also on the list of this week's stupid shit, B. Smith's husband, Dan Gatsby. You remember him. He and his girlfriend, Alex, were a big news story I guess sometime last year, because I think if it happened this year, at least any time after March, it would have been a blip. But I remember it being a big story. And I actually wrote about it for Essence. Dan Gatsby recently did an interview with, I want to say like a local TV station out in the Hamptons. 
where he lived, or at least where he was living with his wife and his girlfriend, who he says now he didn't live with. She was just there on weekends and had a room to keep her stuff. Yeah, that kind of sounds like living there, sir. But okay, all right, let's, let's, let's go with that. He did an interview recently. I believe it's the first since his wife passed away. I, I had two takeaways from the interview. He said that his girlfriend, Alex, quote and unquote, ran off. The interviewer asked him, they said, well, you know, are you and Alex still together? And he was like, she ran off. What? He didn't explain the backstory to that. He didn't say why they broke up. I don't know. People break up all the time for various reasons. I I can't even speculate as to what that might be. He also, in speaking about his relationship with Alex, and I'm, I'm just mentioning this for a note of clarification, he said that the issue that people had with their relationship is because he's a black man who was dating a white woman. And I was like, ah! That wasn't the issue that people had, sir. I mean, just as, as a matter of, um, of setting the record straight as someone who was very vocal about their relationship, and notably because he was very vocal about their relationship, it was because you seemingly had this woman, white or otherwise, living in your home, and you had this woman taking care of your wife. And according to some folks who saw y'all, One of them being my good friend in D.C. who said that the woman wasn't treating your wife right. And let's frame this correctly. Because Dan was posting his new girlfriend on a Facebook account that he used to share with his wife as they promoted their businesses and restaurant in the Hamptons specifically. When he began posting from their shared account with his new girlfriend... That's how people outside of his social circle were alerted to this information. And then when people were like, yo, what are you doing? He was very combative and angry with them. You invited a lot of this criticism, sir. I just want to be clear. I never faulted him for for seeking companionship because I think that the idea of your, your spouse even suffering from Alzheimer's and you being their primary caretaker is tasking. And it may be tasking in a way that if you've not cared for someone with this specific disease, you may not fully get. So like, I get it. I don't get why he felt the need to flaunt it so brazenly. Like the white ain't really got much to do with it. Like, I mean, some people don't like interracial relationships. I'm one of those people that I don't give a fuck. Like if you love someone, as long as you're not dissing black women to justify your interracial love, I really don't care what you do. Yes, I am aware that there's underlying issues with racism and colorism and and white women being the ideal of femininity that goes into all of this. And still, I say, I don't care. It's not about the white. If you want to have what essentially amounts to an extramarital relationship because of the unique conditions that your spouse is dealing with, I'm not saying it's right. I'm saying I get it. And sir, I respect your grownness. I respect you to do what the fuck you want to do. But if you don't want to hear people's criticism about you doing whatever the fuck it is you want to do, stop telling people what the fuck you're doing. I am a life coach who does trifling shit and makes bad decisions on a semi-regular I'm getting better. Semi-regular basis. And I'm telling you that because I don't ever want people to be like, oh, she thinks she's on a high horse. No, the fuck she doesn't. She just don't tell y'all all her trifling business. I tell y'all exactly what I want you to know, when I want you to know it. And I deal with the backlash and the disagreement of that. And it's fair game because it's shit that I put out there. I'll add one more thing that I didn't put into that piece, which in retrospect, I wish I had. B. Smith, when she was alive and when she was at her best, wasn't involved in no foolishness. Her brand was class. Her brand was decency and order. Her name never should have been affiliated with the fuckery that her husband had her involved in in her final days. That is the core of what people were offended by. It wasn't because the woman was white. It's because black women have to work so hard not to be involved in crazy, not to be involved in foolishness, not to be seen as angry black women, not to be seen as a whole bunch of negative things, even if all they're trying to do is positive. You got to work so hard to get that. And she was one of the few black women that achieved it. And in her final days, you fucked it up. That's why people were mad, sir. One of the things that I used to hate about working out is when my sock would slip off of my heel and by the end of my workout, my heel would be rubbed raw from rubbing up against my shoe. 
Enter Features. Features has solely focused on engineering innovative, high-performance socks for almost 20 years. They've created a sock with a custom-like fit to prevent the issues with conventional socks. No more bunching, slipping, friction, or blisters. I love my feature socks. First and foremost, they do not slip. And second, it's like putting your foot into a well-made glove. Features are engineered to help you achieve your best every day, whether you're working out or on the go. Features are so durable and long-lasting that if you're unsatisfied at any point, they'll give you a replacement pair, no questions asked. See why Features has quickly become the number one running sock in America. For listeners of Ratchet and Respectable, you can receive $10 off your first pair of features. So many of my friends have cats. They prefer them to dogs because cats are apparently way more independent. As much as they love their cat, they're not fond of the stink bombs those cats leave in their litter box. Everything from cleaning to covering up that smell is a constant battle. That's why they use Pretty Litter. Pretty Litter is kitty litter reinvented. Unlike traditional litter, Pretty Litter's super light crystals trap odor and release moisture, resulting in dry, low-maintenance litter that does not smell. And Pretty Litter is virtually dust-free because it's manufactured with a specialized de-dusting process. Less dust and no fuss. Pretty Litter arrives safely at your door in a small, lightweight bag that lasts up to a month. When you get the bags auto-shipped, that means you don't have to deal with any last-minute trips to the store. And shipping is free. For my cat lovers, I think this sounds very, very convenient. But above all else, here is why Pretty Litter is a pet parent's hero. It's a health indicator. Pretty Litter monitors your cat's health by changing colors when it detects potential underlying issues. You won't find that kind of innovation in conventional litter. Get the world's smartest litter without leaving home by visiting prettylitter.com and use promo code RATCHET for 20% off your first order. That's prettylitter.com, promo code RATCHET for 20% off. prettylitter.com, promo code RATCHET. Last. Is it the last? It's certainly not the least. Last night. The vice presidential debates occurred. Moderator Susan Page, Jesus, has largely been decried as terrible. The biggest criticisms are she allowed Kamala Harris and Mike Pence to interrupt each other as well as her throughout the debate. She asked decent enough questions. She failed to, I don't know, she followed up on anything. This is from Politico. Page also drew criticism for her inability to rein in Pence as he frequently interjected during Harris's answers. She repeatedly tried and failed to get Pence to stop talking, saying variations of thank you or thank you, Mr. Vice President, 22 times. Now, I was flying home last night during the debates. Luckily, I was able to get live TV on my flight. I, it took everything in me. Like I, was, I wanted to yell at the screen. At one point in the flight, something happened to the feed. And when it went out, there was an audible groan from the passengers because a lot of us were watching the presidential debates. But I wanted to scream at Paige, thank you, Mr. Vice President, is not effective. You're going to have to try something else, boo. Politico also noted that Paige appeared deferential at times to Pence, calling him Mr. Vice President. Meanwhile, at one point, she used Harris's first name, addressing Biden's running mate as Kamala Harris rather than Senator Harris. She did apologize. Now, this is a mistake that a lot of people make, and I remember being corrected on it by my African-American studies professor when I was in college. I sent her an email, and I have no idea what the email was about, but in her response to me, I remember her writing something like, please note, when you refer to subjects, be mindful not to give title or use the last name of a male subject uh, or recognizing him as an expert. And then when you speak about a woman, you remove her title or you speak about her in a more familiar way as if she is not worthy of the same respect that a man is. Even in college, I still thought of myself as a feminist, but it's something obviously I didn't recognize that I was doing, but I guess I picked it up from the culture. It's something I became mindful of then and I try to be mindful of now. And sometimes I do catch myself doing it. When I speak on the podcast, I'm usually speaking like I'm talking to friends and I'm not being as formal 
perhaps as I should. I've noticed that sometimes when I speak about Hillary Clinton, I'll call her Hillary or I'll call her HRC. I don't, I don't call her by her last name or I don't call her by her title. When I'm doing something like the podcast, which is more informal, or I'm writing captions on Instagram, I can be very informal. When I'm actually writing articles, I make a point to be more formal in my language. But it's, it's something that even when I'm speaking informally, perhaps I need to be more mindful of. It's a, it's a weird situation. Like when I'm recording this podcast, I think because of the medium and, some, and because of, and I hate to say this, but people remind me of it constantly. It, it drives me up a wall because it puts a wall between me and my listeners, which I don't like. And I think it changes the tone of the podcast. I like to speak on the podcast the same way I would if I was sitting around a table with my girlfriends or if I was speaking on the phone with one of my girlfriends, because that's how I feel about you as a listener. But it's it's starting to be like a thing where people are like, well, you have this platform and you have this reach and you need to be more mindful and you need to speak in this way. The expectation that I speak as not a person, but as a brand is frustrating as fuck. But I would try to be mindful of speaking differently about women, even if it's in a more loving or playful or familiar, because I feel like I know them. I feel like they're family. I feel like they've come to the cookout type of way. But I, I want to make sure that when I speak about women who I respect, that I'm not diminishing their accomplishments or respect or the respect that I have for them. Does that make sense? Okay. Despite all the criticism, and there is much, Paige said that she had no regrets about how she chose to moderate the debate. She told the Washington Post, they caught up with her as she was at the airport. She said, quote, I feel good about how it went. I felt it was a relatively civil debate, which is true. I think Pence is also the antichrist, but he was not as belligerent as Trump was in that debate with Biden. Paige said that she acknowledged that the candidates did not always answer her direct questions. And she said the refusal to answer a question I thought could be telling, maybe not as telling as if they had actually answered it, but that was not without some value. She said of her polite request to get Pence to stop talking. She said, I didn't see many options beyond just speaking up and saying, thank you. I didn't have alternatives that came to mind. Saying thank you was the best option to think of. Ma'am, I've moderated a bunch of events. I've moderated events where panelists have gotten a bit unruly, where they have gone back and forth with each other. It is not an easy job. It is not just as simple as some people think as just sitting there and asking the questions. Like you're, for lack of a better description, the ringleader of a circus. You have to make sure that all of, I'm not going to call people animals, but the participants on the circus floor that you allow them to showcase their talents, but you also allow them to make room for others. It looks unscripted to the people watching, but it's actually a very scripted and very orderly sort of event. When it's done right, last night, or with the POTUS debates, we talked about that last week, was not done right. Y'all need to come up with some other solutions and letting people just talk all over each other and then disrespect the moderators as well. If I am the moderator, you might get away with disrespecting somebody on the panel. You will not get away with that shit with me. Try God. Not me. Paige also added that from her seated distance, she could not see the fly on Pence's head (laughs) that lit up social media Wednesday night. When asked about it, she laughed loudly. She said, quote, when I walked off stage, everyone was talking about the fly and I had no idea what they were talking about. I saw the fly on his head as I was watching the debate. And again, I was watching on the plane on that little screen. And I was like, did I flick something on my screen? And then I realized I was like, there's something on his head. And on Twitter, I jokingly asked, I was like, is that a fly or a roach? Flies like shit. Roaches like trash. It could be either one on his head right now. But I woke up this morning and I was scrolling Instagram as I was drinking my coffee on the balcony because that's my L.A. life. (laughs) Like my whole timeline was people talking about that goddamn fly. We're so petty. We're so petty and so silly sometimes. I feel like folks are trying to make the best of a horrific, a horrifically crazy situation. Trump had a unique take on the debate. He said Kamala Harris was a monster. He said that twice during an interview on Thursday morning. He said this monster that was on stage with Mike Pence who destroyed her last night. And I was like, really, is that the take? Because CNN did a poll and I want to say like 68% of people thought Senator Kamala Harris won that debate. 
I bring up Trump's comments, not because I really care what he thinks, but as I was watching the debate last night, I had an open thread about it on Facebook. And I said, and I was like, it's going to be really hard to turn Kamala Harris into the angry black woman stereotype. Because as she was speaking, like she was very firm. She was very direct. She was very informed, but she was also smiling a lot. She was also laughing a lot. She seemed happy. She seemed calm. At no point did she put any bass in her voice, which I would have loved to see her do, but understood why she could not. At several points in the debate, she would have been very right to go full Biden and call Pence the clown that he is. I wish she would have been able to do as Biden did in his debate with with Trump and Trump just would not stop running his mouth. And Biden was like, will you just shut up already? I would have loved for her to be able to do that as a woman, as a black woman. I understand absolutely why she cannot. Women just can't get away with stuff like that. Whatever came out of your mouth that was of substance, that had logic, that made good sense. If you were to say that during a debate, all anyone ever would talk about the following morning is how disrespectful you were, how angry you were, what a nasty woman you were. That's all it would be. Women just can't get away with speaking plainly, speaking with necessity in the same way that men can. Dana Bash on CNN last night was really critical of Harris's performance. She said that she thought she did a good job, but she went into several instances that she wished Senator Harris had been more confrontational. And she said, like, I know as a woman, like she's trying to be nice, but she really should have hit him hard on this. And she should have said this and she should have said that. And she had all these ways that she felt like Kamala Harris was too soft on Pence. I watched it live and forgive me, I don't have the exact quotes that she gave. But as I was listening to, to a white blonde woman, she's the anchor on CNN, and I was like, I mean, I feel like you mean well. I mean, you might, but I feel like you just, as a white woman, like you just don't get it. But like you know what it's like to be a woman at work. You don't know what it's like to be a black woman at work. A black woman at work, and I don't just mean corporate work. I mean any work where you're not working with just black folks, right? You got to deal with white men and their perception of you, but you also have to deal with white women and their perception of you. Dana is a white woman. Like you are one of the people who we got to deal with your shit. Kerry Washington must have been watching the same segment that I was because last night she tweeted. She said, OK, Dana Bash CNN, call me if you want to talk about the mental and emotional gymnastics required of black women in these situations. There's not a chance in the world Kamala Harris wasn't thinking about this. We don't ever not think about it. Her superpower making it look easy. I remember my very first job in New York. I was a communications aide at the Civilian Complaint Review Board, which is a city government agency. I was part of the outreach team, and my job was to go to groups around New York City and give presentations on how to interact with police officers, essentially so it didn't escalate into, quote unquote, unnecessary arrest. In retrospect, I realized that that job was teaching people who get abused by the police how not to be abused instead of teaching the abusers how not to abuse. And although I would say 90% of the groups that we spoke to were Black and Latino, I was the only Black person. But maybe like six months into my job, I'm sitting at my desk and I get an email from my supervisor's supervisor. I remember getting the email and thinking like, well, what does he want? Because... Nothing had happened. There hadn't been a blow up. Like there hadn't been, to my knowledge, like a complaint from any place that I spoke at. Nine times out of 10, when I went to do presentations, they come back and ask me to speak to another group. My boss has specifically told me that, you know, groups write in and they specifically ask for you. We'd done a presentation together because she wanted to know what all the fuss was about. And she praised me. She said, you know, you do. Re-, she was like, you know, you're doing a really good job. That was the last bit of feedback I got from her. I was like, well, maybe I'm getting a promotion. So I walk down to his office and I I knock on the door and I see the boss's boss is a white man behind his desk. And then my boss is sitting in a chair in front and there's an empty chair waiting for me. So he says, you know, come in. And he says, you know, go ahead and close the door. In my very naive mind, I'm still thinking like, oh, okay, of course, if I'm getting a promotion, well, then you would have my boss and her boss make the announcement. Okay. So I sit down and I'm like, hey, you know, what's going on? And I'm like all chipper and shit because I'm like, what, 22? He starts off and he was like, well, I wanted to have this conversation because, you know, your boss has brought some things to my attention. And so he proceeds to tell me that when I come in in the morning, I don't speak. He was like, when other members of your group are doing, you know, bonding activities outside of work, you don't participate. It's just come to my attention that you're not really being a team player. 
And I was like, I was raised with manners. Like it's almost impossible for someone to speak to me and me not speak back. She was like, well, you know, sometimes I say hi to you. And she was like, and you don't say good morning. And I was like, okay, but when you say hi to me, like I say hi back. And she was like, yeah, but you don't say good morning. And in my head, I'm thinking, is this bitch serious right now? The you don't participate in group activities was sometimes we'll go to the pub after work and you don't come or we'll invite you to group lunches and you, you know, you don't join us. In my head, I'm thinking like, I give y'all mofos like seven hours a day. Like I can't get some relief for an hour for lunch. Like you want me to spend all day with you and then go out drinking with y'all bland asses after work. I got places to be and shit to do after work. At the time, I was leaving my day job and going to a second job at ESPN to work as a fact checker. That's a whole nother story, though. But in my head, I'm thinking, like, why would I want to hang out with y'all after work? I had been well versed on how to be twice as good to get half as much, how to be smart, how to be efficient, how to show up on time. But the... The nuances of being black in a workplace where like you're expected to like be all social and tell your business and like hang out with your coworkers and be chipper and shit. Like I I didn't know about that. Here I am sitting in an office being chastised for saying hi when you say hi, but not good morning for not wanting to go to happy hour with you and not spending my lunch hour with you. Are you serious right now? But that's the expectation. And so I listened to this like litany of complaints and I explained my side. And so I think the the white guy boss, he'd been around for a while and he was kind of cool with black people. He wasn't like my fave, but I never thought he did anything unfair. I would say that he was a fair person. He was like, well, you know, here's some things that you might want to consider doing. And he was like, you know, the the high and the good morning, I think that is what it is. But, you know, if if people want to hear good morning, maybe you could just say, you know, good morning. That's not too much. Right. And I was like, sure, if you if that's and this is what I'm saying in office. I'm like, "Um, okay, uh, sure, because I'm blindsided here. Maybe, you know, you guys could all go to lunch together and, you know, get to know each other. You might find that you have some common interests. And in my head, I'm thinking, that's doubtful. But, you know, sure, you need me to go to lunch with you every once in a while so I can avoid these awkward-ass conversations getting called essentially what it felt like, the principal's office. Sure. You want me to go to happy hour with you? Like, I'd rather fucking slip my wrist. But, yeah, I'll go and have half a glass of wine because the idea of having anything more with my coworkers or even hanging out with them when they have anything more, again, I'd rather slip my wrist. Being around drunk white people, Very uncomfortable to be a black person. They start asking you crazy questions about being black. And that's just not a situation that I like putting myself in. I went to all white schools all my life. I know what that situation is. I hate it. So I agreed to these things. And then I asked my immediate supervisor, I was like, if you have these concerns for me, why didn't you just come to me and say, hey, here are some things that, you know, I wish you could do different because I feel like now you've gone and complained to your supervisor and now it's sort of escalated into something that it didn't need to be and this woman looked me dead in my face and she was like I didn't know what your reaction would be if if I brought it to you I didn't know if it would escalate and she was like honestly I was scared scared of what I'm on my first job I'm on my p's and q's I remember my first day of work like I went to the big boss supervisor and I was like what are your expectations for me in this job because I really want to make sure that I do a good job like this is my first job out of college like I'm very like bright eyed and willing to please and just happy to have my first job and move to New York I wanted it to work out and I was like you're scared of me and she was like I just I just didn't know how you would react. I asked her, I said, what have I ever done to give you the impression that you should be scared of me? Give me an example of why you would fear me. And she was like, I don't know. It's just, you know, it's just how I felt. Bitch, what? So when Dana Bash goes on CNN and she starts criticizing Kamala Harris saying, I wish she had been like more um, forceful or more aggressive with, with Pence. I want you to know that she could not be. Her constant smiling, that woman wasn't happy about shit. She was annoyed as fuck with that man because he kept talking over her. And every woman, not even black woman, I think every woman who's been at work with men knows what that feeling is. There's a TikTok video circulating right now of a white woman in STEM. She's on a conference call with her classmates. She recorded a video and she edited it together of all the times they keep speaking over her when she's speaking. A lot of men have a fundamental lack of respect for women and it often comes out in the way that they speak to them, the way that they speak over them. And it was on full display last night with Mike Pence. Kamala Harris would have loved to tell that man he was a clown and she would have loved to tell him, just shut up. And the best she could do with a smile, I'm speaking. 
I'm speaking. She waited for him to finish speaking so she could speak. She showed that man deference and respect. And despite all that tap dancing she did, despite that masterclass she put on of a well-behaved black woman at work, Trump wakes up this morning and calls the woman a monster. And that's without her being aggressive. It's a no-win situation as a black woman working. And again, not just in corporate, a black woman working anywhere unless she's working with other black people. And really other black women. A black woman speaking her piece to a black man gets you the angry black woman shit too. Another conversation for another day though. Is there something interfering with your happiness or maybe something preventing you from achieving your goals? If you feel this way, it's totally normal. And BetterHelp is here to help. BetterHelp's mission is making professional counseling accessible, affordable, and convenient. So anyone who struggles with life's challenges can get help anytime, anywhere. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You'll connect in a safe and private online environment, and anything you say is confidential. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. If you are in need of a little help, even if it's just a check-in, BetterHelp is a wonderful option. I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash ratchet. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash ratchet. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people. Explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity. I've been taking a Skillshare class called Productivity Masterclass, Principles and Tools to Boost Your Productivity, taught by Ali Abdal. This is really good for me because I love to procrastinate and I can't right now. I have so much going on. And this class is helping me be far more efficient. Skillshare offers membership with meaning, with so much to explore, real projects to create, and the support of fellow creatives. Skillshare empowers you to accomplish real growth. They have classes to fit your schedule and your skill level. Skillshare is also incredibly affordable. An annual subscription is less than $10 a month. Explore your creativity at Skillshare.com slash respect. And the first 1,000 people to use our link will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. Receive free access to thousands of classes for a limited time. Be one of the first 1,000 to sign up at Skillshare.com slash respect. The Salon with Lala Milan is a new podcast I think you'll love. You might already know Lala from her viral videos on Instagram and TikTok or her famous parodies on YouTube. And if you don't, you're missing out. Not only is she a hilarious actress and comedian, she's an expert on giving beauty tutorials and fashion tips. And Lala and her squad are known for their unfiltered conversations and savage pop culture gossip. Her podcast, The Salon, is all of that and more. Lala and her guests will talk about sex, relationships, situationships, and anything else that comes up. They'll also cover the latest trends in beauty, juicy celeb gossip, and everything in between. Listening to Lala will give you tons of laughter and all the advice you need right now. Nothing is off limits in the salon. Check out The Salon with Lala Milan right now in Stitcher, Apple, or your favorite podcast app, and make sure you subscribe. Oh, this is, this is the last but not least. I told you earlier in the podcast we were going to talk about Trump, and as much as I really don't want to, I'm going to. I'm only going to do a very quick recap. If you've been alive for the last week, um, you know all the highlights of of the ish that's been going on in the White House. Last Friday at 1 a.m., Trump announced that he and his wife had COVID and people did not believe he was sick. Initially, Trump seems to blame um, his senior aide, Hope Hicks. 
She had symptoms of COVID when she was flying back from the debate. She said she quarantined herself on the plane. I don't really know how you quarantine on a plane with circulated air, but maybe the president's plane has a special air system. Um, this is the story that the news is running with, but then it doesn't make sense because Trump announces Friday morning that he has COVID and then Friday night he's going to the hospital and it's like, wait, if you were just exposed Wednesday after the debate, would you already be getting sick? So then the reporters do their job. They start digging and they start reporting and they start to trace this COVID infection back to an event in the Rose Garden at the White House for the Supreme Court nominee. Let's back up a minute. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg dies on September 18th. Before she passes, she says, quote, my most fervent wish is that I will not be replaced until a new president is installed. She says this to her granddaughter days before her death. Trump hears this and essentially says, fuck that. He will nominate who he wants whenever he wants. Before RBG is even buried in Arlington, he announces that his pick is going to be this woman, Amy Coney Barrett. He announces her as the replacement on September 26th. This is eight days after RBG dies. So the White House has an event in the Rose Garden for Barrett's official nomination. There's an indoor event with the VIPs, and then there's an outdoor event. At either the indoor event or the outdoor event, it's believed where Trump, and at this point, as reported by the New York Times, 36 people are infected as a result of this event. It's, and it's everyone from unnamed federal employees to senior Pentagon leaders. This list includes the First Lady, Melania Trump. We just talked about senior presidential advisor, Hope Hicks, senior Trump advisor, Stephen Miller. He's one of the most raging racists in the administration. Press Secretary Kylie McEnany, who's got one of the nastiest dispositions of any person, woman or man, I've ever seen. The list of infected also include Trump campaign manager Bill Stepin, S-T-E-P-I-E-N. I don't know how to pronounce it. It's not Stephen. Stepin. I don't know. Let's move on. The Republican National Committee chairwoman. Kellyanne Conway, who's also a despicable human being. And again, just I'm not saying that because she's a woman. I'm saying that because she's a despicable person. Trump advisor Chris Christie, the former New Jersey governor. Notably, upon diagnosis, he immediately checked himself into a hospital because he is a morbidly obese man with asthma. Three GOP senators were also infected, as well as the Notre Dame president, Father John Jenkins. I think I mentioned before the 11 people who were infected during the Ohio debates. They may not be senior officials or have prestigious jobs, but they are worth mentioning as they are humans who are infected with a potentially life-threatening disease as a result of their interactions with the president and other senior staff from the White House. All these people ain't going to make it, y'all. Statistically, somebody's going to die. I'm not a betting woman, but if I was, I know who would be at the top of my list. You can probably guess. And just to be clear, I don't wish death on anyone. I don't wish life either. I don't wish get well. Ava DuVernay, she put out a message on Instagram, which I reposted the message. I thought it was a sign. I was like, oh, the Ava has had it. She said to Trump, and actually it might've been on Twitter, Twitter or Instagram. I truly hope you get well as you're infected with a life-threatening virus and are physically ill. This is what she wrote to Trump. Also, you are a disgrace and a liar. You've cost hundreds of thousands their lives, and you're a white supremacist. Get well, sincerely, and after that, we're going to vote you out. I didn't see anything wrong with what Ava said, but people were hot. They were like, how dare you wish this man get well not once but twice? She was, they were like, didn't you do a whole series about the Central Park Five where Trump called for their execution? Even after they were exonerated, he wouldn't apologize for calling for their death? He wouldn't accept that they were innocent. And this is who you want to wish get well to. Ava took down that post where she wished him well. You know what I wish? I wish for the Lord's will to be done. I believe God is an awesome God. I believe God is an on-time God. I have faith. I also wish that folks would respect the dead or at least the dying wishes of the living. Because if Trump and the White House and all those GOP congressmen, if y'all had abided RBG's dying last wish, if y'all weren't so goddamn hypocritical, 
trying to push forward this Supreme Court nomination. Because when Scalia died 11 months before Obama was about to leave office, y'all were like, nope, nope. It's an election year. Too soon. Can't do it. Now it's two months out and y'all want to do a nomination to replace RBG? If y'all hadn't been such damn hypocrites, if you'd respected a dying woman's last wish, you might not have a Republican Party in complete shambles or quarantining a month before the presidential election. Ah, well. That's all I got. Oh, one more thing. Vote, goddammit. Vote. That's everything. If you need some ratchet and respectable in your life between now and the next episode, you can follow me at Demetria L. Lucas on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. Also, I put new copies of Don't Waste Your Pretty up for sale on my website, DemetriaLLucas.com. If you would like a signed copy of Don't Waste Your Pretty, they are available again for a limited time only. So that is everything. Thank you as always for listening to Ratchet and Respectable. We will speak again soon. Okay, bye. So many of my friends have cats. They prefer them to dogs because cats are apparently way more independent. As much as they love their cat, they're not fond of the stink bombs those cats leave in their litter box. Everything from cleaning to covering up that smell is a constant battle. That's why they use Pretty Litter. Pretty Litter is kitty litter reinvented. Unlike traditional litter, Pretty Litter's super light crystals trap odor and release moisture, resulting in dry, low-maintenance litter that does not smell. And Pretty Litter is virtually dust-free because it's manufactured with a specialized de-dusting process. Less dust and no fuss. Pretty Litter arrives safely at your door in a small, lightweight bag that lasts up to a month. When you get the bags auto-shipped, that means you don't have to deal with any last-minute trips to the store. And shipping is free. For my cat lovers, I think this sounds very, very convenient. But above all else, here is why Pretty Litter is a pet parent's hero. It's a health indicator. Pretty Litter monitors your cat's health by changing colors when it detects potential underlying issues. You won't find that kind of innovation in conventional litter. Get the world's smartest litter without leaving home by visiting prettylitter.com and use promo code RATCHET for 20% off your first order. That's prettylitter.com, promo code RATCHET for 20% off. prettylitter.com, promo code RATCHET.